light pollution. That has to do with light pollution and its effect on bird life. And uh, being from the Audubon Society, she's <laughs> that's right up her alley. And we're anxious to hear what Mary has to say. I know this is a very big issue, and I'm a, a big bird person, and I've got numerous bird feeders in the yard, and and I'm uh, keenly aware of the problems of uh, the bird's experience today from many different areas. But uh, Mary is going to be uh, tackling this issue, and we're looking forward to hearing from her. So you can take it away, Mary. I'm muted. Now I'm unmuted. There we right, go. Great. Well, I am going to start by sharing my screen. Bob, can you just give me a thumbs up that you see that? Yeah, yeah, it, it's coming through. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. So yes, as Bob mentioned, my name is Mary Coolidge. I'm with Portland Audubon. And I run our BirdSafe program, which specifically deals with the issue of light pollution and its impact on birds and in fact, whole ecosystems and human health as well. Um, and the issue of birds hitting windows. <clears throat> I'd like to start with this image. Um, this is a composite photograph taken by the gentleman who runs something called the Sky Glow Project. Arun Memedinovich and Gavin Heffernan. And this is a sandwiched photo of the downtown LA skyline or a piece of it and a brilliant night sky with the Milky Way visible. And I think that the impact of this photograph is to remind us that there is a fully starry night sky above us every single night of the year if only we could draw back the curtain of light pollution or in some cases here in the Pacific Northwest the curtain of um, clouds. But this is a nice reminder to us that there are stars up there all the time and we've really lost a lot of this amenity in our brightly lit cities. Okay, so I wanna give you a little overview of what we're gonna to do today. I'm gonna to set the stage talking about what light pollution is. I'm sure folks are familiar with it, but sometimes it's good to just ground into the basics. Um, I'll talk about the primary impacts of light pollution, including ecological health, human health, some equity considerations where humans are concerned, and then a little bit on energy and climate. Certainly we'll talk about safety as well. Solutions and best practices that have been developed to address this issue, and then some things that are happening in the Portland metropolitan area and statewide. I'm actually not sure what the reach of your organization is, but we'll at least get statewide with this, and then how you can get involved if this captures your imagination. Uh, I included a, an image of the cover of a book called Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting. This was edited by Catherine Rich and Travis Longcore. Some of you may know Travis's name. He's a professor at University of Southern California. Considered probably one of the foremost authorities on light pollution in the United States. And they held a conference, I think in about 2002, and brought together a bunch of researchers in North America to talk about what was going on with this issue of light pollution. And as a result of that, they published, <clears throat> uh, which is a compendium of research papers looking at this issue so that folks who weren't at the conference could actually access some of this information as well. And this was really my introduction to the issue of light pollution. I came on Portland Audubon at two, in 2008 I was charged with beginning to do a little bit of research on the window collision issue, and I quickly found that light pollution was a related problem that was resulting in a lot of birds hitting windows, and also came across this book and started to realize that this was a much bigger issue than just affecting birds. Yeah. And that was back in 2008, and there really wasn't a lot of information out there. There wasn't a lot of media covering this issue. And these are all snapshots that I've taken from media sources just in the last year, I would say. And really everybody from Forbes to the New York Times to CNN to the Los Angeles Times to the Guardian, 
everybody's talking about light pollution now and the loss of our night skies and the related health concerns and ecological impacts. So thankfully, I think this is an issue that's getting a lot more attention than it has gotten in the past. And so people are a little bit more primed to think about the unintended consequences of the way that we light our nights. I wanna take us into the uh, way back machine for a minute. So for about four and a half billion years, there was no artificial electric light on this planet. And all of our biological systems developed under these regular cycles of bright days and dark nights. And that really set up what we call our circadian rhythms, which govern all of our biological processes by and large. There are a few exceptions, uh, but this is humans included. So again, here is the kind of night sky that humans would have slept under every clear night of the year prior to light pollution. And now here's a NASA satellite image taken in 2011. So already what, tw um, 12 years ago. So this is already outdated, but you get a sense of what our um, planet looks like when seen from space. And so we have really started to light the night on much a much more global scale than has, has ever been known before. This is just in the last 130 years or so. And today, according to the US Census Bureau, over 80% 80, 80 of people live in urban areas where they're pretty much awash in artificial light all night long, every night of the year from things like street lights and sports fields and um, billboards and things like that that are just illuminated all night long. Folks may be familiar with this. This is something called the Bortle Scale. It was invented by a guy named John Bortle in 2001, I believe. And he uh, invented this as um, to be useful for amateur astronomers to be able to compare the relative darkness of their viewing sites. And this scale is read from right to left. So over here on the right, we have a class one excellent dark sky site. Uh, places in Oregon where you can see a sky like this, the Alvord Desert, Steens Mountain, Hart Mountain, Summer Lake, all have these brilliant night skies. And then as you move from right to left across this scale into brighter and brighter areas, you can see the loss of the starry night sky as more and more light pollution is introduced. So over here on the left-hand side is an eight or nine inner city sky. Portland, Eugene, Salem, and Medford are all characterized by this kind of sky, at least in the central city. There are, um, in all cases, going to be areas outside the central city that are not quite this over illuminated, um, but all of these cities have at their core an eight or nine um, inner city sky rating. And this is more or less what that looks like on a map. So again, the black areas on this map are class one world-class night skies. The areas that are white, like here's Los Angeles, here's Portland, um, these are inner city skies. And this is an excerpt from the New World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness that was published in 2016. It was a team of Italian astronomers and NOAA researchers that put this together. And what they found when they overlaid their light pollution data with uh, Census Bureau data was that 99% of people in the United States live under light polluted skies and fully 80% of people can't see the Milky Way from where they live. So we are really divorcing ourselves from our night skies. Mm. Now, here's the uh, Mississippi more or less. And you can see that west of the Mississippi, we're in much better shape than they are in east of the Mississippi. There's considerably more light pollution in the east, uh, eastern United States. But we still have plenty of light pollution out west. And in fact, if we look at this excerpt of Oregon, you can see that there is almost a continuous band of light pollution along the I-5 corridor. I do want to point out this red circle here on this Oregon map. This is the Great Basin. It's a fairly um, low population out here, low density population in southeastern Oregon. This is the largest intact area of world-class night skies in the lower 48 states. So a really incredible amenity that we have right here in our home state. And then of course, there's some pretty nice sky um, 
peppered throughout the state, particularly down here on the South Coast. And even the blues are still pretty good skies. It's really when you get into the warm colors that you see considerable loss of the stars. But what are we doing when, you know, when we're really divorcing ourselves from the night sky like that? This is a, a cultural resource that we have had a relationship with um, throughout the, the history of human life on earth. And we, we really don't have much of a relationship with it anymore, particularly if we are in the city. And this is, um, these are just a few images of how we get there. Uh, we have unshielded lighting that is uh, brighter than it needs to be, and in many cases on all night long. So this is a kind of a Luke Skywalker light orb in a park in southwest Portland. Another light from a uh, close by area where the LED bulb is at the top of this pole. And then there's this separate shield across the top of it that is supposed to contain that light and reflect it back down to the ground. When in fact you get above a light that is designed like this, you see that there's all kinds of light spill that ends up around the sides of this yeah, in, insufficient shield on this light. This is an empty parking lot in Southeast Portland at Ross Island Sand and Gravel. These uh, light bombs are on all night long, every night, and there's nothing, not a single vehicle parked in this parking lot. And in fact, now it's entirely fenced off. Another empty parking lot in Southeast Portland also illuminated all night long. And then a pretty classic look at a billboard commonly designed with the lights along the bottom of the billboard and shining up across whatever is being advertised. There are some billboards in the city of Portland that have lights across the top that shine down. It is definitely possible. There are other cities and countries, Costa Rica comes to mind, where you see billboards with lights across the top of the billboard. So it's definitely possible to do a better job of designing our lighting so that we're not just casting it up into the night sky. This is a very simple diagram that just shows the areas of useful light and then the areas that contribute to what we would call light pollution. So here's the area of useful light below the light fixture. And then we have the glare zone out here, all this light trespass, light entering um, a neighbor's home. Folks are probably familiar with this. I hear a lot from folks who have issues either with street lights casting light inside their homes or neighbor lighting one way or another casting light into their windows. And horizontal light can actually travel a very great distance. So this is not innocuous out here, even though it's not directing straight up. And then the other thing is that there is a lot of glare that happens when light bounces off surfaces. So we have to consider how much light we are casting down that is then reflecting up into the sky and also creating light pollution. Um, I'm just going to make a note that if folks are not muted, it might be helpful for everybody's ability to hear if everybody was muted. Um, I'm sure that you are all very well aware that we are in an era of mass conversion from high pressure sodium lighting to LED lighting. And LEDs are great. They are long lived, they're really energy efficient, they require relatively little maintenance, so they're great in terms of climate change and energy efficiency. However, we have not always done a good job of selecting appropriate lighting, and there is a huge range of LEDs available on the market. Early generation LEDs were all this kind of light um, this wavelength output that produced a lot of this blue light. We've really come a long way in the last oh, 15 plus years of LEDs being around. And so now you can get lighting that is more appropriate for use at night, particularly outside, but inside as well. So for folks that aren't really familiar with wavelength spectrums, I just want to point out this graph over here. So the light um, on the cooler end over to the left, this is short wavelength lighting. The light on the right, this is longer wavelength lighting. And the short wavelength photons have a lot more energy than the long wavelength photons, which means that they bounce around a lot more than long wavelength light. And that those photons then are bouncing off of dust and water particles in the atmosphere. 
and contributing more to light pollution. So this, this kind of light absolutely increases sky glow. What we see is, is that there's this spike over here right at about 450 nanometers. Um, this is at the peak sensitivity area for particularly birds, but all other mammals as well. Uh, this is effectively mimicking daylight. So we would see a lot of blue in daylight and that's fine. What we don't want is to have this kind of lighting outside on the landscape at night, because what it does is it suppresses melatonin secretion in humans and other vertebrates, and that interferes with our sleep schedules. Unfortunately, this is exactly the kind of lighting that we are um, have been seeing in street lighting applications, 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin LEDs. And the American Medical Association has actually cited concerns about human health risks associated with this kind of lighting. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's just kind of a primer on the kind of LED lighting that's particularly problematic when we're talking about ecological light pollution, but also just light pollution in general. So um, when we are introducing artificial light at night, we are really jeopardizing these long developed and very carefully choreographed relationships between all members of the biological life system. And what we see are things like skewing the timing of breeding behaviors, nesting behavior, migration timing, foraging behaviors, even bud burst and leaf drop in plants. Um, we also see confusion in celestial navigation for some species, and we'll see that um, a little bit more with birds. This can cause misorientation in nocturnal movements of some species, particularly when we think about uh, Pacific sea turtles, we're causing misorientation in their movements. It can result in attraction or repulsion behaviors in some species, bats, for example, and we'll talk a little bit more of that about that. It can re reduce fledgling success in some birds and it can interfere with predator prey relationships. And we're gonna dig into more of that. This is just a tiny, tiny snapshot of titles um, of peer reviewed published research papers looking at the impacts of light pollution on either individual species or on whole ecosystems. And there are now hundreds and hundreds of papers looking at various aspects of ecological light pollution and absolutely none of it is good news. Even in the rare case where we find, oh, a benefit from maybe peregrine falcons staying up past dark and hunting at street lights, there are unintended consequences to that, both for the peregrine and for other species. So it's really, none of it is, is good news. And this is just, again, a very tiny sample. Here are some brief examples. Um, impacts of light pollution have at this point been demonstrated in at least 200 species and representatives from every taxa. So birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, amphibians, uh, invertebrates, all of it. Uh, so here in the upper left-hand corner, uh, dung beetles have been shown to actually use the Milky Way for orientation of dung balls back to their own home areas. Pretty incredible for a tiny insect to be able to do something like that. Harbor seals have been shown to use what's called a lodestar. So when they're swimming across areas of open water with very few terrestrial landmarks to use, they pick out a star on the horizon, they follow it until it drops below the horizon, and they already have another star picked out that they can continue to follow. Again, pretty incredible. Um, I don't think many, if any, humans could do this without the aid of technology. Misorientation, as I mentioned, in sea turtles. Um, so these guys group dig out of their dry sand nests and they have one job and that job is to get out to the ocean, which when there was no artificial light on the planet would have been the brightest horizon over the ocean. They're programmed to follow the brightest light. But of course, as humans have illuminated streets and homes up the beach, sea turtles have started to move up the beach rather than down the beach. And these guys already have a very, very low survival rate. So it is critical 
that they make it out to the ocean in terms of the success of the future of their species. Luckily, there's been a lot of work done to uh, modify lighting to make it less impactful for sea turtles around the world. Still work to be done, but this is certainly something that we would consider a relative um, success story. Great tits, I realize this is not a great tit. It's a um, British species. This is in fact an Anna's hummingbird, but great tits have been shown to have reduced fledgling success when they nest under white light LEDs. So what they find is that there is elevated corticosterone level or stress hormone in the bodies of these adults that are nesting under white lights. And that is significantly correlated with fewer young successfully fledging out of those nests. There's some fairly recent research that shows that there is circadian perturbance in monarch butterflies as a result of light pollution. So these are diurnal migrants. They are not migrating at night, and yet the exposure to light pollution at night is um, causing disorientation for them in terms of both timing and um, direction in their migratory movements. So really unfortunate in a species that's already having a pretty hard time for a number of other reasons. Predator-prey relationships between owls and their prey, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, delayed emergence has been shown in eastern redback salamanders that were exposed to even just very dim string lights at night. They delayed their emergence from the, the leaf litter by an hour or two from the usual time around dusk that they would emerge. They also restricted their movements, so they stayed more undercover. This really impacts their ability to successfully forage to mate and to disperse to new uh, breeding areas. Uh, absolute 100% reproductive failure has been demonstrated in clownfish. Um, other aspects of their biology seem to have been unaffected by light pollution, but they have a 0% hatch rate in their eggs when these are exposed to light pollution at night. Repulsion and attraction in bats, We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. I don't know if folks remember, I think it was 2019 when there was this mass attraction of grasshoppers in Las Vegas, Nevada, one of the most light polluted cities on the planet. Uh, I think it was estimated that there were 45 million grasshoppers that descended on the city in this mass attraction event. And that's not good for the business owners in Las Vegas or for the people visiting Las Vegas and certainly not good for the grasshoppers that descended on the city. Okay, so we're going to dig a little bit into bird migration. About 70% of North American birds are actually migratory and 80% of those migrate at night. So even if they are diurnal species like warblers, sparrows, thrushes, tanagers, king kinglets, gross beaks are just some examples these guys will migrate at night. And they do that because the atmosphere is less turbulent at night, it's cooler, they can avoid diurnal predators, and they can also preserve daytime hours for foraging as they are resting. And the other critical thing is that they are using the stars as a guide to help them navigate. Generally, what they'll do is they'll take off about 30 to 45 minutes after sunset, and they will, uh, migrate all night long if conditions are good. That is unless they come into areas where there is a lot of light pollution and that drowns out the stars that they are using. We're also remember talking about birds that are generally diurnal. So they exhibit something called phototaxis, which means that they are attracted to light. Folks may remember this case of the standard insurance building in Galveston, Texas back in May of 2017, 398 birds collided with that building. In one fell swoop, three birds survived and were taken to rehab, but the other 395 of them died on site. Um, subsequently, the Standard Insurance Building did agree to participate in the Lights Out Texas program. You can see that there are still some lights on inside this building and on this building, but it's considerably less illuminated than it was before. So hopefully they continue to participate in the Lights Out program. They certainly got a lot of bad press, um, which can be very motivating. This is the NASCAR Hall of Fame 
in fall of 2019, about 300 chimney swifts collided with this building. You can see that it's really only about a two story building, quite illuminated. So it doesn't actually take a high rise um, or even what we think of as a relatively low rise building, a two story building will do it. And that will just attract birds in where they hit the glass because they don't recognize it as a barrier. Uh, as promised, Bob, I'm going to talk um, just briefly about window collisions. There's a lot of research that is going into this issue, and we know that window collisions today kill somewhere between 365 million and, one birds <laughs> and 1 billion birds per year. That's a million birds a day, even if you take the low end of that estimate. Uh, that puts window collisions among the top three um, anthropogenic conservation issues that are creating pressures on our wild birds. That's after habitat destruction and um, feral and free roaming cats. So window collisions is third only to those two other issues. We also know from a report that came out of Cornell School of Ornithology in 2019, Kenneth Rosenberg released a paper that told us that we've lost about 30% of our North American birds in the last 50 years. So we know that our birds are in trouble and this is one of the leading causes of that decline. Now, most collisions actually happen during the daytime and that is because birds don't see glass as an obstructed flyway. They, all, all, they either see reflections of, of sky and vegetation and things like that in windows and they run into it or they see habitat on the other side of a window. That may be because of windows that are meeting at a corner or windows at something like a skywalk or a very window building where there's a clear view to the other side of the building and birds run into it. Most collisions are actually happening within the first 40 to 60 feet of the ground. That's because that's where birds are spending the bulk of their time foraging and nesting and moving around. And what has been found is that the reflection of trees and vegetation and feeders actually increases the risk because you're drawing birds into areas that are that have essentially high value habitat for them and then there's a hazard right there it's a little bit akin to putting up a bird feeder and then having your cat sit under that bird feeder so you're exposing birds to an increased risk um, by attracting them in now, there, the reason why light pollution is a related factor is because as we're talking about birds migrating, they're moving through our brightly lit areas, they are attracted into our cities, they spend the night here, and then they wake up and they encounter window glass that in some cases they may never have seen before. Um, in many cases, a bird's first encounter with window glass can also be its last, unfortunately, because they hit it and die from that collision. Luckily, there is a lot of work being done now to help us reduce our light pollution, particularly at key times of year. So there are radar ecologists at the Colorado State University. Oh, oh, maybe somebody could mute their Zoom link. Um, so radar ecologists at the Colorado State University Aero Eco Lab, also radio, radar ecologists at Cornell University, and they are tracking bird movements using uh, weather technology. So Doppler radar stations across the United States. Turns out birds actually have unique signatures on radar maps. And while radar ecologists can't tell the species of birds, they can differentiate between small, medium, and large birds. And they can tell the difference between birds and bats, birds and precipitation, and birds and large flocks of insects as well. So they are tracking this radar technology and they can, number one, tell us when our peak of migration is, when we're having these huge movements of birds. We happen to be about to enter the peak of fall migration, which is estimated between September 19th and October 19th. And in spring, um, we have April 15th to May 19th. Now, spoiler, um, birds are keeping it complicated for us this year. And we already have a red alert for tomorrow night when the folks at Colorado State University are telling us that we will have 5.5 million birds that will fly over Oregon in a single night. 
I think we have somewhere on the order of 4 million tonight, 5.5 tomorrow night, and another 4 million the following night. They only release these forecasts every three days or th four three days. So it's much like radar. Um, it's much like weather forecasts. We don't know very far in advance, but we get this information and then we share it with our networks to ask folks, building owners and managers in downtown areas, but also residents across the region and across the state, please turn off your unnecessary overnight lighting so that birds can continue on their migration pathways and not get sucked into the city. Um, this is a very cool resource at the Cornell University website. This is BirdCast, and this is what's called their migration dashboard. So you can go in and put in your location. You can see that I've put in Oregon here, and then you put in a date, and it will tell you how many birds crossed Oregon that night. It will also tell you the peak of migration traffic. This is a number for birds that fully cross the state. You can do this also by county. Um, and this is the number for what the peak number of birds was in flight at a certain time overnight. It will also tell you who the expected nocturnal migrants are. This is based on eBird data and also historical data of when birds are moving. So this is an incredible resource. Uh, let's dig into just a few examples, some case studies of light pollution affecting individual species. This is a purple martin, essentially a giant water-loving swallow. Maybe some folks are familiar with these guys nesting in gourds that folks put up to encourage them to come nest near waterways. And it has been shown that exposure to 10 or more nights of light pollution for these guys just in advance of their migratory period causes them to migrate over a week earlier than birds that were not exposed to artificial light prior to migration. That may seem kind of like a benefit to this bird because the bird that gets to its nesting territory early is also going to get some of the best nest sites. However, in the case of the purple martin, which is an obligate insectivore, which means that they eat insects, they need to get here not before we have a real glut of insects for them to eat. If they show up and it's still too cold and we haven't had some of those big insect hatches, there's not much for them to eat. And one thing that is very critical for these guys is that they are putting on a lot of fat prior to nesting season because it is very metabolically expensive for them to raise young. So kind of an unintended consequence for even a diurnal migrant. So this is not a nocturnal migrant that we're talking about here. This is a really interesting case of the house sparrow where Meredith Kernbaugh in the University of South Florida lab of hers took 50 house sparrows, a really common urban species, not native to North America, but a common urban species. Uh, half of them, well, all of them, sorry, she injected with West Nile virus. Half of them she allowed to sleep in darkness. The other half of them were exposed to 12 hours of dim light at night, followed by 12 hours of daylight. And what she found was that the birds that were allowed to sleep in darkness managed to kick the West Nile virus levels in their system down below infectious levels um, twice as soon as the birds that had been exposed to artificial light at night. Now, this is a zoonotic disease, so birds that are infectious twice as long as other birds are carrying West Nile virus that can then be transmitted by a mosquito that bites that bird and then goes on to bite a human. And this is a very serious disease that you really don't want. So this has incredible potential public health implications when we're thinking about light pollution at night affecting disease transmission rates. Okay, so light pollution impacts to predator-prey relationships. We know that with short-eared owls and other owls that the ability to successfully hunt increases with available light. So the more light that owl has, the more quickly it will be able to capture a deer mouse, which is its quarry. However, 
uh, deer mice have evolved a behavior on moonlit nights where they restrict their activity. They come out less, they spend less time foraging, they stay more under dense cover in order to avoid predation by short-eared owls. So then the question becomes, when we are installing street lights and other kinds of lighting out on the landscape that is brighter than full moonlight, and we're doing that every single night of the year, what are we doing to this very careful balance that has been struck <laughs> between some something like a short-eared owl and a deer mouse that really um, needs that moon cycle in order to, A, both eat, but to also avoid predation? Bats, well, bats are definitely not the most popular wildlife on the planet, but they are in fact really cool and also important vector controls for us. So a bat can generally eat up to its full body weight in insects in a single night. And a lactating female can actually eat twice her body weight in a single night. There are about 1,400 bat species around the world. We have 15 documented species in the state of Oregon. And eight of those species are on the Oregon Conservation Strategy species list. That is essentially ODFW's watch list for bat species, which means that there are concerns about their population. The bats in this list that have asterisks next to them, these are the bats that are on the Oregon Conservation Species list. Now, what we know about bats is that some of them are actually attracted to streetlights in order to forage. And in fact, some of the same individuals will be documented night after night after night, just habitually using streetlights as a buffet for the insects that are attracted to them. Other bats, the slower flying bats, um, like um, some of the myotis bats and definitely the Western pipistrelle, they are repelled by lighting. So light, say street lights, for example, that may not be a physical barrier on the landscape for them, but it may as well be, it acts as a physical barrier. They won't go anywhere near it. And that's probably because they're slower flying and they're a little bit more vulnerable to prediction if they're hanging out at those street lights. So there is some research that is showing that light pollution is up there with things like impervious surfaces and intensive agriculture in terms of influencing bat activity um, and that reducing light pollution can actually improve connectivity for bats in developed areas. And relatedly, some research that has been being done for the last oh, almost 10 years is showing that white light LEDs actually attract almost 50% more impacts uh, insects than their high pressure sodium predecessors. So this is a photograph that I took at Providence Park or um, the soccer stadium where the Timbers and the Thorns play in downtown Portland. They put up some new bright white LEDs just about three or four years ago. And this was a summer night, I was at a soccer game and I was astonished to look up and see all of these insects attracted to these lights. It's not that common a sight in Portland. We're just not that buggy. Certainly there's vector control in the Portland area, but I was astonished to see that these new lights were really attracting a lot of insects. And then there has been some interesting research um, that has come out in the last several years. This top, one, this top one here is research out of Germany that showed that the biomass of flying invertebrates has decreased more than 75% in the last 27 years. So that is an incredible <laughs> loss of biomass. Certainly there is a lot of conversation all over the place about how many fewer insects are being detected now than in years past. And there was a follow-up study in 2018 that actually found a correlation between light pollution and declines in insect populations in this area. So they overlaid the data with light pollution data and found that there was in fact a significant correlation. This is another paper that came out in 2019, light pollution is a driver of insect declines. So now artificial light at night combined with habitat loss, chemical pollution, um, invasive species and climate change is driving insect declines. 
So this is, you know, light pollution may not itself be a direct mortality factor for all of these species that we're talking about. But I think that especially here in the language that came out of this paper, it brings into sharp focus for us that there are all kinds of pressures on our ecosystem today from a variety of different, usually anthropogenic or human related sources. And light pollution is just one more. It happens to be one that we really can control uh, fairly easily, much more easily than other forms of pollution. So let's talk about human health really briefly. First of all, there's a lot that we don't know yet about the relationship between light pollution and human health. But what we do know is that we have non-image forming cells in our eyes that are just light sensitive, particularly to blue light. And what happens is blue light or daylight strikes um, those non-image forming cells in our eyes, sends a message to our brains that it is time to wake up. It's time to be alert, get a lot of work done, and um, melatonin is suppressed in our systems, which then keeps us awake or dysregulates our sleep. Now, different people have different levels of sensitivity to dysregulated sleep. I, for one, am a pretty good sleeper, but many other people are not, and light pollution is a significant factor. It's why we get all kinds of messaging about not going to bed with our cell phones at night and our computers or other um, devices, or if we do, that we need to make sure that we have the factory settings on those devices to dial down the blue light. Hopefully everybody knows you can do that on your cell phone and on your computer. You can tell the computer to block out some of the blue light that's being produced. Your screen will look a little bit yellower but it's a pretty small price to pay if you're struggling with sleeping. Now, the other thing I made a little bit of a mention of is that our street lights are increasingly emitting this kind of blue light. So back in 2016, the American Medical Association reported, um, it released a report citing concerns about increased risks of breast and prostate cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even retinal damage from um, direct uh, looking directly at blue rich white light, glare and hazardous driving and walking conditions for people that are exposed to light like this. And they recommended that municipalities minimize the emission of blue rich white light by new lighting systems that are being installed on streets. Now, maybe some folks have experienced this. I certainly have where you have a street light outside your house and it is casting light directly into your room. And when we think about that, some of us who are homeowners and have access to certain resources can either buy room darkening curtains and install those on our windows. Maybe we can plant a tree that actually helps block the light. Like for example, the house behind this tree is probably enjoying some buffering from the street light entering into their house. But if you are low income, or you live in a rental, you may not have access to make some of those choices. So it becomes a little bit of an equity issue as well. This is a February 2022 report from the US Department of Energy on solid state lighting, which is LEDs and research and development opportunities. I pulled this language out because it's something that we haven't seen in previous Department of Energy reports, and it's a tremendous step forward in terms of recognizing the issue and starting to address it. So just to read a little bit of this language, we now know that lighting unavoidably affects human health and well-being. It's now current, clearly understood that existing lighting practices can negatively impact human health and well-being, roadway light, lighting, signage and light spillage from buildings at night all have negative impacts on local wildlife. And then finally, most LED lighting products and installations do not follow these practices. We haven't talked about best practices yet, but we'll get into those. But LED technology has the capability to fully optimize all of these practices. So I love to see this coming out in a DOE report because if we have federal leadership on this issue, we are going to make a lot more progress on this strategically nationwide as well as locally. We have to talk a little bit about public safety because we have certainly been told over and over again that more lighting equals more safety. And that simply is not true. What we need is for our lighting to be designed better, more thoughtfully. 
we know that overly bright lighting actually creates really bright areas adjacent to areas that have deep, dark shadows that we can't see into, which provide concealment for criminals. We also know that bright lights that don't have any kind of shield on them, when we look directly at them, causes a lot of glare. This constricts our pupils. Now, when we move into an area that's not as well lit, it takes a while for our eyes to adjust, particularly for the aging human eye. And when I say aging, we're talking about over 40 years old. So for folks who are over 40, when you move from a very bright area into a dimmer area, it takes longer for your eyes to adjust than it would for somebody much younger. So we really need to be thinking about how we thoughtfully design our lighting. The other thing is that motion sensor lighting is better for deterring crime because it introduces an element of surprise for somebody that is maybe hanging around with some nefarious intent. The other thing is, for example, I have a motion sensor light on my front porch. If that light pops on, I know that there's something larger than a raccoon on my front porch. And that um, signals me to go have a look and see what's going on out there. So it heightens my awareness of what's going on outside. I wanna point out these two side-by-side -side photos down here. The first one is a photographer taking a picture of a light that has no shield on it on the side of this building. You can't really see into the dark areas because you, in this case, the camera, this is not exactly a facsimile of what the, the human eye would do, but it is a similar principle. The camera is picking up on all this glare and that is what it is attuned to. Now, when the photographer holds up their hand and creates a makeshift shield, suddenly the camera can focus more into the shadows and see that there's actually a person stand, standing there. Something similar happens with the human eye. If you are looking at a bright light, your pupils are constricted, you can't see into this darkened area. So again, we just need to be a little bit more nuanced and thoughtful about how we are designing our lighting. There's not a whole lot of research that has gone into studying the relationships between lighting and crime and lighting and traffic collisions. But there are a few papers out there. Um, one that I wanna point out is the Chicago Alley Lighting Project. This is from back in 2000. The city of Chicago increased um, alleyway lighting in the alleys around Chicago in both frequency. So they added additional light poles and they also increased the light intensity or what we called then wattage. And what they found was that crime increased 21% after that lighting project was um, undertaken. Now, part of this probably describes more reporting of crime, but some of it also describes that there was more light available for people to be engaging in nefarious activities in alleyways in Chicago. Another one, preventing crime, what works, what doesn't, what's promising, National Institute of Justice. This is a direct quote. Is street lighting an effective approach in the reduction and deterrence of crime? The answer is inconclusive. We have very little confidence that improved lighting prevents crime. Pretty interesting stuff. This is a more recent report from 2018 from RF International and Monash University undertaken in Australia. They surveyed women and girls from around the area and asked them to identify areas where they felt safe and unsafe in public spaces around the city. And then they overlaid that survey information with lighting data. And what they found was that women and girls in the Melbourne area felt most unsafe in areas that were overlit, especially if they were overlit with a lot of blue rich white light illumination. What they found was that more layered lighting and warmer lighting actually made people feel safe, safer. Again, I think this takes us back to A, the um, issue of being in a very illuminated area with dark areas outside of that, that eventually you have to move into and you feel unsafe or you're just not sure what's lurking out there, even if you don't move into that area. Um, the other thing is just that there is a subtle message that is sent to us when we are in, in overlit areas that there is something we should be concerned about in that area. So there's a subtle message there, a subliminal message that's being sent. Just to very quickly talk about equity, 
Um, these are a couple of papers that have been look, looking at the issue of equity and light pollution uh, and environmental justice. The, the first one here, artificial outdoor light at night and sleep duration in middle to older age adults found that higher levels of artificial light at night were actually associated with short and very short sleep and that the association between artificial light at night and short sleep were larger in neighborhoods with higher levels of poverty. The second one here, light pollution inequities in the continental United States, environmental justice analysis, found that there were racial disparities um, in the way that we are lighting our neighborhoods. So higher proportions of Black, Hispanic, and Asian American or renter occupants experienced greater exposure to ambient light at night and Asian, Hispanic, or Black Americans had twice the mean exposure levels to light pollution in their neighborhoods than white Americans. And they found the same inequities, whether in urban areas or rural areas. So we are not lighting our neighborhoods equitably. No really big surprise there, um, but it's important that this kind of stuff gets written up in peer reviewed journals. I know you all talk a lot about climate change and sustainability. These are numbers that have been produced by uh, Dark Sky International, formerly the International Dark Sky Association, based on Department of Energy data. And what they have found is that outdoor lighting represents 13% of residential energy use. That's pretty enormous when you think about all of the lighting and other energy that we are using in and around our houses. So 13% of that is outdoor lighting alone. They also found that 35 to 50% of light nationwide is wasted. That means that it is directed up into the sky, not in a space where it's useful for our nighttime activity. Now we know, of course, that we need light at night to safely move around after dark, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, in the dead of winter, we have very short daylight hours. We need artificial light. However, we need to be designing it so that it is actually helping us circulate safety, not safely, not so that it is just ending up in the sky above. They found that this waste represented three to $5 billion a year of energy loss and 21 million tons a year of CO2 emissions. So this is huge. And a lot of this is lighting that could probably just get turned off at night or could be converted to motion sensors, say in our empty parking lots at night, or our unnecessary um, architectural lighting on buildings that's not actually doing anything for our safety or circulation. Okay, so to the good news, there are best practices that have been developed by the Illuminating Engineering Society together with Dark Sky International, and they are fairly um, self-evident. I think minimize any unnecessary lighting. If you don't need it, don't specify it. Don't turn it on. Don't design it into your building or your property. Lighting should be fully shielded and aimed down so that it doesn't end up in the sky or in people's eyeballs as they are trying to safely navigate around. Limit the total brightness. Again, we're talking about making sure that we aren't creating a lot of light, even if it's directed at the ground, that then just bounces off of those surfaces back up into the sky. Particularly wet surfaces reflect a lot of light. So think about winter in the Pacific Northwest, it's wet a lot of the time, a lot of light is gonna be reflected off of wet surfaces. Use adaptive controls whenever possible. So motion sensors or occupancy sensors and dimmers and timers and choose warm colors. So we want to really keep our lighting more to that warm yellow and less to that blue rich white light when we're talking about outside at night or even in our bedrooms. So maybe in your utility room or in your shop, you want to have really bright white light, that's fine. Just don't be exposed to it late in the evening and don't use it for your outdoor lighting. So warm color temperatures. I want to mention I'm also on the board of Dark Sky Oregon, formerly the International Dark Sky Association Oregon chapter, and we have an Oregon Sky Glow measurement network. Um, this is this unit called a unihedron, that's the manufacturer's sky quality meter. This is actually taking photos of the night sky every five minutes all night long, 
And we have 45 of these that are distributed around the state right now. We have 15 more that are in discussion. They are hosted by volunteers. I have one in my backyard in Southeast Portland. My responsibility as a volunteer host is that four times a year, I get on a ladder, I pull this guy down, I plug it into my computer and I download the data off of it. I put new batteries in it and I redeploy it back up on my shed roof. Um, this is a weatherproof case that the sky quality meter is housed in just to keep it nice and dry. And here's a, a map of where we have sky quality meters around the state. So everything that is a star represents a sky quality meter. I'm in here, this is me in Southeast Portland. We have a high school astronomy teacher in Southwest Portland that has one at his house. And then they're just around the state. Obviously we have some gap areas that we're still trying to fill, but um, 45 around the state, this is a little bit outdated. The circles on this map are uh, sky quality meters that are in discussion. And then there is a report that is produced every six months that is uh, outlines the data that is being collected so that we can track changes in our night sky and light pollution over time, which is really pretty important in terms of understanding what the problem is and how we can start to address it. I just want to make a mention of some things that have been and are going on around the state and in the metro area. So in 2020, Sun River was designated as our first Oregon dark sky community, which means that they have made a commitment to making sure that their lighting is shielded and not producing light pollution locally. They do have an observatory right there on site, so that's a huge motivator for them. State Parks has gotten very interested in this, understanding that they not only offer resources to park visitors during the day, but that their night skies are a tremendous resource. More and more people are actually traveling for astro tourism or night sky viewing. So Prineville Reservoir State Park was the first Oregon State Park to be designated. They have a number um, of other parks that are in the process of being designated. Cottonwood Canyon State Park. Um, Willowa Lake State Park, those are a couple of others that are also in process. In 2021, Yahats adopted a new lighting ordinance that attempts to reduce light pollution. In 2021, Port Orford on the South Coast updated. They already had a dark skies ordinance. They updated it to be even more um, protective of their night skies, recognizing that this is an important tourist amenity and also that it's good for folks who live in that town. Hmm efforts that are underway. We are just about to enter our Lights Out 2023 fall season. As I mentioned, we already have a Lights Out alert for tomorrow night. Uh, Multnomah County is about to adopt bird safe standards into their own green building policy. So that affects only their own buildings, but they are committing to make sure that they are bird safe, both in terms of windows and also not producing light pollution. The city of Portland has just begun an effort to develop a lighting ordinance, which we do not currently have. This will be tremendously important, not only for us, but for surrounding, surrounding communities. And in fact, you can see sky glow from Portland, from Mount Hood, from um, Hood River, from Goldendale Observatory in Washington. So our light pollution from Portland is visible from a long way away. So we need to start to at least stop the hemorrhage if not try to make some, um, some better choices about our existing lighting. Sisters is working on a lighting ordinance update and they would like to achieve dark sky certification. I mentioned Cottonwood Canyon. There is an effort to designate that whole Oregon outback area that I pointed out very early in this discussion as a dark sky sanctuary. That takes BLM, the Forest Service, um, county properties, private properties, everybody has to participate in making that commitment. And Deschutes County, I believe, is about to begin an update to their lighting ordinance as well. So how you can help, if you are in the Portland metropolitan region, you can take the pledge to go lights out. That doesn't actually mean that you have to turn all the lights out on and in your house. It just means that you will look for opportunities to improve, particularly your outdoor lighting, um, but as well, potentially pull your blinds, particularly during migration seasons. 
Uh, follow best practices in lighting design all year round. Close your blinds and turn off unnecessary lights, particularly for that peak month in spring and fall, but year round if you can do it. Uh, watch and share our lights out alerts. We have one out right now on Portland Audubon social media. Uh, Multnomah County about to adopt this bird safe standard. So sending a letter to the county commission supporting their choice to do this would be very helpful. And we'll be sending out an action alert about that next week. And you can volunteer to host a sky quality meter on your property if you're interested. They do cost about 350 bucks. And we ask the host to spring for those just because we don't have a budget for it at Dark Sky Oregon. And then you're on the hook to pull that down uh, four times a year. If you have a spot on your property where it can be located just on a fence post, that's perfectly fine. It just has to be above any lights that are on the property and ideally above the tree line. Okay, let's see. Oh, I'm gonna leave you just with a few inspiring photographs. So this is the prairie line in Tacoma, Washington designed by Place Architects. This uses relatively low level, nice ambient lighting to illuminate this public space in a fairly good sized city. Down here, Herman Lake Park Plaza in Houston. Both of these images are taken from that park. This is a huge city in North America and they have this really nice lighting. It's plenty of light for wayfinding. The steps here are illuminated. There are undermount lights on these railings on this bridge. Again, um, lights under this railing that are casting light down so that you can see where you're walking. Really lovely place to be. I'd go on a date here, right? This is creating such a lovely sense of, of place. This is lighting on the waterfront in Vancouver, BC. Again, another really huge city. And they have just this nice, subtle lighting that has been very thoughtfully designed. So we don't need glare bombs to make sure that our public spaces are illuminated enough that they are vibrant and also safe for us to be in. This is um, the Fair Hair Dumbbell in East, uh, Southeast Portland, or so, sorry, Northeast Portland at Burnside and MLK. And this is a really cool building. It's relatively bird safe in terms of windows. The windows are not very big. It has public art on it, which is really cool. However, the last thing they did was come in and put these giant LED lights on the top of these entryway canopies. And these lights shine up along the side of the building. This is kind of the same principle as billboard lighting. There is no reason why the lights can't be at the top of this building aimed down to illuminate the side of this building rather than aimed up. All of the light that glances off the side of this building just ends up in the night sky. This is a different example. This is Mother Earth painting on a building in Southeast Portland where they have elected to illuminate this painting, this public art from the top down. So this is actually a, a long linear light here that casts light down onto this painting. And then it also produces a little bit more light on the sidewalk below. So even more light for safe circulation around this building. Much better to light public spaces like this than like this. So it is absolutely possible. And that's it. I don't know if I've been talking for too long, but if we have the time and if folks have questions, I'm happy to field any of those. Real quick, uh, this is Greg, Greg Thurman from LaGrande, Oregon. So you, you were talking about the frequency of the light LEDs and that warm. What was the, the frequency? Stay away from the four... 50 that warmer light the, the best practice is 3000 kelvin or below more more and more the recommendation that we are seeing is actually 2200 kelvin or 2700 kelvin when we think about our old high pressure sodium lights those are really probably something around 2000 2100, they're really low. Those were very yellow, if you recall. So the ideally in terms of getting that spectral output to be very narrow and having as little broad impact as possible on ecological systems, you really wanna choose something that is yellower. 
Ideally, we get to something that's even kind of amber, um, but that would be something like probably 1700 Kelvin. We do see that kind of lighting, like on the big island of Hawaii, for example, they have very, very yellow lighting. That's because they have a world-class observatory at the top of that island, and they are really trying to preserve their night skies. And folks that live on that island are just accustomed to the observatory being a key driver in the way that some decisions are made. Um, so yeah, try under 3000 Kelvin is really the best practice. And if you can get all the way down to 2200, even better. Well, our, our LED lights are displacing the old incandescent lights and the incandescent lights, you couldn't buy a, a daylight incandescent light. They just you know, didn't, uh, didn't have them, but, uh, they were, they ran about 2700 or degrees Kelvin or lower. And I always try to buy LED lights because the blue ones just look horrible. I had the daylight, daylight uh, people are putting them for their outdoor lighting and around their garage and all their garage lights or their post lights. And they, if they put in one of those blue lights, they just look awful. And uh, they can easily buy you know, all, all of your LED lights, uh, give your, your Kelvin, you know, whether they're warm or, uh, daylight or I mean it's easy to find but people aren't accustomed to looking for that because they've always used incandescent lights and they couldn't get anything that was too hot yeah and they're not labeled as well um you know you have to look really hard to try to, to figure do. out what you're buying um I have noticed that in the big box stores if you happen to shop there I always recommend you know shopping at your local hardware store if you can but if you go into a big box store now they have displays. So there are there's a kiosk that has light bulbs and you can actually push a button in front of each of them and see what that light is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. They are not always clearly labeled with color with Kelvin temperature. Um, and we got so accustomed to, to purchasing our light bulbs by wattage. And now that's not really, wattage is really a measure of energy efficiency, how well that light converts, uh, that bulb converts energy to light. It's not a measure of how bright it is. So now it's much more challenging to figure it out. You can even buy a front porch light that's nine watts, labeled as nine watts LED, and you could read a book out there, which is a little more light than we generally need, you know, if what we're doing is just trying to illuminate our front porches for safety and to get up and down the stairs. Well, that's because an LED light is about seven times more efficient than an incandescent light. So it takes, uh, say, one seventh of wattage to produce the same lumen output. Yep. Yep, exactly. I have recently discovered dimmers that you can buy um, at least on Amazon and probably elsewhere as well. But because I had had such a hard time finding string lights for my yard that didn't feel like they illuminated it like a movie set, um, I bought dimmers and it really makes the outdoor string lights more palatable, a more, a more appropriate level of brightness. I mean, I've bought string lights for my yard, plugged them in and been like, I'm blinded. When, you know, when you're trying to create a nice ambiance in your backyard, it's just total overkill. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, so dimmers, I find, are if you can't find something that is an appropriate amount of illumination, you can put a dimmer on it. And oftentimes the dimmers also have timers on them. Mm -hmm. Or get a lower wattage light. Um, and and uh, anyway, Mary, I want to thank you very much. It's been very informative. I've enjoyed it a great deal. And oh, good. A lot out of it and uh, perhaps we can have you back at another time to uh, give us an update on how we're doing sure absolutely and again um anybody is welcome to reach out to me if you have questions or thoughts or concerns or anything you want to follow up about m coolidge at audubonportland.org um bob or mike can probably share my contact information watch for red alerts this migration season it's happening it's upon us um, and xerces society if you want to talk about pollinators i also work at the california condor breeding facility so if you want to talk about condor recovery at some point give me a shout okay 
Well, one, one thing I'm going to do is get motion detectors for my lights because I leave them on for a, a long period of time, and there's no sense in having them uh, on all the time. I only need them when they're, I'm out there, and the motion detector can turn them on for me automatically. And uh, you know, that's a, a great reminder. Yeah, I'm a big fan of motion sensors. Okay, well, thank you okay. so much for having me. And well, thank you, Mary. Yeah, get in touch if you have questions. Will do. You take care. You too. Bye bye now. Alice. I see you, Alice and Dick. <laughs> you got your sound turned off. Yeah, I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Alice. If I uh, I don't see Adam or Phoebe, and we have another uh, Zoom link to for our follow up meeting here. So uh, if we could all uh, pop off here and gotcha. okay, log in again. Log in again on the new Zoom link. Okay, we'll do. Well, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Well, when you click that.